So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Strasser. I'm from the Austin Institute of Technology, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar, uh, which is organized by the Horizon 2020 Research Infrastructure Program, uh, IRIGWIT. I hope that uh, all of you can, can hear me very well. Uh, just a few um, uh, comments before we start uh, with the webinar. Uh, all of you are muted, you can listen uh, what we are uh, telling you about uh, our co-simulation based assessment methods that we have developed in the IRIGRID project. If you have questions or comments, please put uh, them uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, the chat. Uh, we will answer them by the end of the uh, webinar or maybe also if there are too many questions, uh, we'll get back to you uh, later on with our answers. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and we will put all the material on our project website. You will get also notified when this information uh, is available. So the, uh, the presentation itself, the recording uh, and additional material will be made available. You will get uh, informed about uh, that uh, separately by, by email. Um, I want to mention also that this webinar is supported by two IEEE technical committees, one from the Industrial Electronics Society, the Technical Committee on Smart Grids, and from the System and Cybernetics uh, Society, the Technical Committee on Cybernetics for Intelligent uh, Industrial uh, Systems. Um, before we start with the webinar, I want to introduce uh, briefly uh, our speakers that are telling you much more about our developments. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce uh, Peter Palensky. He's full professor for intelligent electric power systems at the TU Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, he's supported by his two colleagues, Arjen van der Meer, his postdoc and program manager for the Power Web Institute at TU Delft and research fellow at the EMS Institute in the Netherlands. And Richard Pandia, Pandia his PhD candidate at the TU Delft. Then I want to introduce also my uh, colleague Edmund Wiedel, he's senior scientist for integrated energy systems here at AIT in the Center for Energy. Uh, we have Nabil Akraut, he's a R&D laboratory engineer at Oma Zapal, a company which belongs to the Vilatia Group uh, in Spain. Uh, we have Kai Heusen, uh, he's assistant professor for electrical engineering at DTU in Denmark, and his colleague Tue Wissing Jensen, his postdoc for electric energy systems at, DU, uh, at DTU in Denmark, and also Van Hoer Ngen, uh, his postdoc for smart grids at CEA in France. All of these uh, people and the institutions are partner of the IRIGRID project. And it's my pleasure to handle now over to uh, Peter and his colleagues, uh, which uh, start with the uh, um, webinar. And I hope you enjoy uh, what you will uh, see and hear during the next uh, couple of minutes. All right, thank you, Thomas. I hope everybody can see my screen. And good morning also from my side. Um, I will uh, briefly introduce the motivation of why we all do these things. And it's rooted in the energy transition. Yeah? Don't worry, I will not bore you to death now, uh, but I would just like to point out what happens currently. You know, the power system is the backbone of our society. Almost everything depends on it and it gets more serious in the future. Huh? We are electrifying industry, transport, heating, all at the same time. So the last remaining business sectors that were kind of independent are also depending on the power system. And during that transition, uh, we have mega trends like decarbonization, um, uh, the, what happened now? Decarbonization and uh, uh, in, uh, urbanization that are not negotiable. We have just an ICD problem now. Yeah. Anyway, I'll just continue talking. And uh, what we do with the bottom power system of the future is connect different business sectors and different technologies and different markets. And uh, that changes a lot yeah? from our uh, uh, homomorphic power system when it comes to a multidisciplinary uh, system that requires lots of different um, skills. Do we get back to our screen? Something crashed. All 
All right. Yeah, so I can. Wait. Okay. 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 Can you mute your uh, the speaker? Speaker. Okay, so um, the moment we want to connect different sectors and different disciplines, we enter this uh, exciting field of cyber physical systems. Uh, we have different types of, uh, of uh, uh, business sectors and uh, even within them there are different types of skills that we need to, to harmonize. Uh, in this picture I've shown four of them. If you look at an intelligent energy system we have all the physical assets, cables and pipes and machinery and transformers on the left upper corner and that is typically described with uh, differential equations and, and that's what's, what you typically learn in an engineering uh, degree. Um, on the left lower corner we have all the IT parts typically described with state machines, uh, queuing theory and, and everything that is discrete, yeah? discrete events for all the ICT, um, telecommunication and so forth. On the right upper corner we have uh, everything that has a role, people, agents, market players can be described with game theory and, and if it becomes more than 100 participants you typically switch to multi-agent uh, descriptions. And on the right bottom corner stochastical statistical processes like the weather or uh, uh, we have an aggregate of many many individual uh, players and these descriptions and these models and these phenomena need to be harmonized when you analyze them. Unfortunately, they are mathematically completely incompatible. There is no unified workflow that can handle all these different types of beasts. There are first steps towards universal multi-physics and hybrid and heterogeneous languages, but they're all far away from being uh, suitable for industrial use. Yeah, they are very promising and academically interesting, but if you want to use it in a day-to-day, -day, real world use case, you have to go to something more robust. I'll switch. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. So the, the solution, it's more like a workaround, is called co-simulation. If you have a hybrid system, it's on the bottom, in, in this case uh, an electric vehicle, and you have different domains to analyze uh, holistically. In this case, it's a power system, power electronics, the car that drives and comes back, a market with prices and a battery and so forth, maybe communication to synchronize all these things. Then uh, the co-simulation way of doing that is to model all subsystems in a dedicated simulator. The advantage is that you can use established tools which are specialized for that domain. They have nice languages, nice user interfaces and workflows that can uh, quickly and reliably model these subsystems. What is then needed is coupling these uh, subsystems and their respective simulators. So you're outsourcing the or you, you're delaying the problem to a later stage in your in your project. Um, the moment you have a simul uh, modeled the moment you have your subsystems modeled, you have to connect the individual simulators in the end. And um, let me switch. Okay, that takes a while again. And it's exactly uh, this coupling and the workflow of co-simulation that GRE2 of Erigrid has really uh, uh, has been advanced within the Erigrid project. Here we are. Um, on the bottom, you see. An example of three such subsystems, they consist of a certain model and a solver maybe, and they have to interact somehow. Yeah? They have to exchange their states and their variables. And it's the question, how you do that? Yeah? How do you coordinate the individual simulators? How do you start and stop them? How do you synchronize them? How do you link them? All the interfaces are uh, the big question. And uh, GRE2 of Eregrid has exactly contributed to that question. So it makes life easier for engineers, for scientists that want to describe a heterogeneous modern smart grid, uh, where different types of uh, elements, technologies and models are connected. And around this co-simulation thing, you might have another workflow 
of optimizing it, of describing scenarios, and that's also something that the Eric Grid has um, advanced. Um, by that, I would like to hand over to Kai Heusen, uh, the first uh, scientist that will uh, explain the details of uh, the GRE2. I believe, Kai, you need to unmute yourself. Technical detail. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for both the int nice introduction to code simulation and the advice. Um, in this part of the presentation, I would like to introduce what contributions we have um, made in the Aerogrid project focused on code simulation. Understand what we've worked on. Let's take the initial scenario from Peter into a more concrete setting. Um, what we have here is a low voltage grid on the left hand side and high voltage system with a wind farm connected on the right hand side. Um, so, two different power systems aspect. Um, we have a voltage control um, on load that changer that in, is informed by remote um, over voltage of the end of the feeder. Um, we have an embedded control at the onload step changer, and we have also embedded controls at the wind turbines. So if we were to assimilate this now in the classical approach um, using a monolithic tool, we would have to actually draw in a lot of information about these different um, aspects of the model. So let's look, what, what do we have to decide about? We have on the one hand, a larger power system, we would, we might prefer to model this in an RMS way. Um, but when we are modeling the wind turbines and considering transients, we really should also look at um, the, electromagnet uh, yeah, the electromagnetic behavior to understand the interactions of the inverters. Um, if we're going further to model the control, Peter emphasized there are discrete event systems. And when we're going to communications, there are also discrete event systems of a different nature where we're more interested in the delays. Um, so if you're modeling this um, in a classical approach, you face the problem of actually deciding where do you model each of these components? Um, you know, how do you define a solver that solves all of these different problems um, and handles several time scales at the same time? Um, Peter emphasized, you have different disciplines of expertise that go um, go into building such a model. But if you use a monolithic tool, it's also, it's also harder to reuse models from a different part of the company or a different researcher. So in every group, we're trying to overcome these challenges. Um, and in the first part, I will now look at uh, setting the contributions and later Van Hua will introduce um, the technical part. So the work package um, area two that has focused on uh, code simulation areas has developed the following contributions. We've um, developed new methods for simulator interfacing. Um, all is open source. Um, we have developed methodologies for synchronization. Uh, of simulators to achieve a correct coupling. And we've improved the code simulation workflows to make life easier for each of the users in the future. In today's um, webinar, we would like to focus on the technical contributions so you can follow up. Um, we would see the following benefits. Um, on the one hand, we'll see that um, our support for open source tools but also a standard orientation towards standards will support in accommodating needs both of um, research and industry. Um, the reuse of validated models will be illustrated both by um, hooking up sort of black, or black box components um, to different scenarios, um, as well as hooking up hardware coupling, um, hardware to uh, different models. 
We will also demonstrate how you get to um, more realistic deployment scales in larger scenarios. Concretely, um, we will demonstrate the reuse of component grid models um, and hardware. We will show you the open source applications of the FMI standard, um, both to automation and communication simulation. Um, and we'll have a scenario of practical scaling up of these um, simulations. Um, but why is scaling up such an important point? This is worth to look into. Um, so the smart grid, um, one of the key features is that it will have a lot more active components. And to understand the phenomena that will emerge here, we're not dealing just with physics, as Peter emphasized. Um, so we want to explicitly represent this complex system context for evaluating the component behavior in a system. Um, if we want to do this evaluation, we need to consider that reusing models that are validated or that may be black box because they're coming from a proprietary development, um, then reuse is better than abstracting a model or just scaling it up. Um, so to see the right phenomena, we need to reuse these models and hook them up correctly. Um, and this brings the next question. How can you assess a real scale scenario? We've looked into this problem and we can clearly see that just making the scenario big is not good enough. You need to understand what you're looking for. So it's not just a question of tools, but it's also one of methodology. Um, we have developed a um, classification of different phenomena that could happen and giving orientation of how this um, methodology how these phenomena will make your life harder and easier depending on how you approach the problem. Um, this is documented in our reports and I would like to stop the theory part here and go directly over to Van Hoa to, to tell you more about the technology we've implemented. So thank you. So I'm glad to talk about our technical contribution in the our demonstration aspect. So in early grid, we choose to work with the functional interface standard. And uh, in general, the functional mockup interface standard is a tool independent standard to support both model exchange and co simulation of a dynamic model using a combination of a XML file and a C code. The idea of FMI is converting simulation model from different to which are not interoperable to interoperable black box model, which is called a functional mockup unit, independent of the environment or language that we can freely integrate together or to other simulator. So in general, there are two types of FMG, the FMG for model exchange and FMG for co-simulation. In your FMG for co-simulation, the solver is directly integrated into the FMG for solving the dynamic model. On the other hand, the FMG for model exchange does not have a solver integrated and require the host simulator to provide its solver for solving the FMG dynamic model. For instance, the utilization of FMG is not straightforward and uh, requires some coding knowledge. And uh, moreover, not all simulation tools for now supporting uh, FMZ. So in early week, we we uh, we develop the um, the FMI plus plus library to break the gap between the basic FMZ FMI specification and the typical requirement of a simulation tool. The FMI plus plus library addresses the problem for model and tool with interface according to the FMI specification by providing high level functionality, which is the handling and manipulation of search model and tool. Furthermore, the FMI blood blood library provides utility to implement FMI compliant interface for a last class of a simulation tool. The FMI blood blood library allows passing and handling of our input and output of an FMG. And in case we can have FMG model return, the library provides also an open source integrator for solving dynamic model. Basically, the FI plus library provides 
a simulator independent platform for manipulating MMU with cross language wrapper. An interesting characteristic of the libraries is the capabilities to offer look ahead and run back functionality. So another challenge in implementing uh, MMI standard is a lack of supporting for coupling software and hardware with industrial controller. So one, on one hand, it requires establishing a communication channel between the software model and the real component. On the other hand, the interaction is required to satisfy strict real-time constraints. In every rig, the developed MMI terminal block is capable of solving uh, MMI-based model in soft real-time and uh, expose the in and output of the model via a few boot interface, which can be used by industrial controller. So our toolbox focus on even by communication, which do not restrict communication to fixed time interval. So MMI terminal block also support a periodic operation in case even a trigger within a fixed interval. Another contribution is the improvement of, a, of Mosaic. So Mosaic is a flexible smart rig co-simulation framework to combine simulation model and simulator to create large scale smart rig scenario. And by large scale, we mean thousands of simulated uh, simulator distributed over a multi simulator process. So the main contribution of Frederick, <coughs> sorry, is uh, to introduce the capability of, uh, of um, create a time SIP connection in uh, Mosaic. So for example, consider the connection between two simulator A and B, connection for data exchange before calculation are called standard connection, since they are part of the typical functionality of Mosaic. The new type of connection is a time, time SIP connection that uh, they will provide data to simulators that already have been called for calculation. So overall, the extension of Mosaic improves its usability and provides it with a small common option for handling cyclic dependency in some black box go simulation. So I would like to uh, talk about our demonstrating test scale now. So in general, as a guy already pointed out, SmartGrid is a large scale uh, combination of multiple domain with different behavior for example, continuous and discrete event, and time scale from microsecond, nanosecond to hour or days. So, in order to uh, establish a co-simulation framework for holistic assessment of a smart grid, we need to deal with the coupling of a simulator with different um, energy domain, which will involve the cyclic dependency between continuous simulator we need to deal with the coupling between power and ICT uh, domain, which involves the coupling with continued solver and decorate event solver. And we need to deal also with the real time testing of a control, which involves the integration of a, real of a real controller in hardware and the model in software. So, in a real, in, in a real, we choose to work on the three test case. On one hand, if we provide our purpose to overcome shorter challenge, and um, on the other hand, if we demonstrate the application of our toolbox in your consumation framework. So the first test case is, uh, the first test case is, uh, in consideration, a uh, test case considering the integration of a wind power plant towards the grid and the application of a low voltage or uh, foot drive through controller to shut a system. The GERP, the first four of a test case of the TC1 is to demonstrate the feasibility of the FMI based co simulation tool chain developed in WPKIC. They are a tool for the assessment of model with cyclic dependency. And uh, the second test case involves the integration of a co simulation framework in the testing of a industrial controller. The system on the test here is 
he on a uh, on load task changer controller it's a uh, and it associated test environment so as a power source and load the our focus is put on var various on various uh, OFVC controller implementation, which was uh, selected as our object of investigation. So the feasibility of MMI based code simulations that include coupler, hardware, the uh, demonstrate in this test case. And uh, the last one, test case, is uh, an integration of power system and uh, ICT network, which is very uh, common scenario in uh, in a uh, smart grid. However, it is not easy to arrest because the two systems, the two subsystem exhibits very different uh, behavior in terms of a uh, in terms of a uh, solver, in terms of a uh, of a uh, dynamic. And uh, in this test case, we demonstrate our MMI interface for an F3, a direct uh, event solver for communication system, and uh, and uh, we demonstrates the coupling between two models of computation for communication network and power system. So, so in the following, I would like to invite you to take a closer look at the test case in the review by uh, by our by our by our presenter by our presenter and. Uh, don't forget that the source code of the test case are available on our GitHub and our website. Thank you. Thank you, Van Hoa, um, for the introduction to the test cases and also Kai for explaining the, the approach we took in, uh, in, in GRA2. Um, so, we will now go a little bit into more detail about the um, uh, co-simulation assessment of continuous time um, simulations, so test case one. And um, as, as Van Hoa indicated, it's about the resolving the cyclic dependencies in the master algorithm. And um, by Doing and, and which mainly um, exhibits this, uh, itself in uh, continuous time models, so physical models that show an, uh, a mutual interaction between the respective subsystems of the system under test. Um, so the approach we took in our test case was to first. Um, yeah, specify well if we want to assess such a problem with uh, with co simulation. What are the design criteria of the of of the test case um, of the uh, of, uh, and, and the development criteria? What are workable and um, and, and uh, well, how can I say good systems to test such? A phenomena uh, and also to um, work on the implementation so it's a, it's trade-off between size and accuracy that you you have in such test system and see which what which tools do we uh, do we use here um, and, and and which properties do we want to have uh, from the uh, from the dynamic models that are developed in these tools then the actual development phase uh, where we actually um, build um, the, the um, system in the test and the models in the, in the subsystems and, and try to validate them. And um, correlated to that, we have, of course, because we are using the functional mockup interface, we have to build uh, wrappers for FMI++ exporters for Power Factory in this case and, uh, and master scripts that, uh, that run the respective APIs. And then we will actually run experiments and test their validity and their scalability. Um, so, well, cyclic dependencies, mutual coupling between um, simulation tools, they have to be resolved in both initialization phase of the simulator and also in the during runtime. And um, so what we did was thinking about what, what, what might be a good, uh, good test system for that. And then we came up with a, a test system that 
on one hand is uh, shows um, trend instability type dynamics, um, but also contains um, components that um, can impact these dynamics. And then we came to converter interface generation, uh, more specifically um, wind turbine, uh, wind turbines, uh, and um, the tools that we used for that for developing the wind models was uh, was Matlab Simulink with the Sim Power System toolbox. And for the grid part, uh, Power Factory um, in um, RMS mode. And, and for the uh, application of uh, FMI for model exchange and FMI for co-simulation, which is is part of this uh, this test case, we had to build and to to adjust uh, the uh, FMU exporters uh, to to work with the ones from uh, from Simulink and to. to <coughs> Develop the one in FMI plus plus for uh, for uh, for Power Factory, developed by uh, by AIT here, and uh, in uh, in Eric Grid. And for the system in the test, well, this is a simplified single line diagram of, uh, of the the test system. So on one hand, we want to, to on the left hand we want to have real grid dynamics. On the right hand, we want to have um interactions that are commonly exhibited by wind power plants. So what we did was to have the IEEE 9 bus test system and replace one of the generators, in this case generator 3 on the right hand side by a um, wind power plant of equivalent uh, rating, uh, of equal rating, and by doing so um, keep the actual operating points in the system unchanged. So at the point of common coupling um, which was bus three, is bus three is, uh, is is the same as the original generator. So, well, one thing was to to implement all these uh, these models and, uh, and, 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 and grid components in Power Factory as a monolithic simulation as reference. And for the co-simulation, we actually made a split at the point of common coupling of the wind power plant. So bus three here. And um, so, so all the uh, grid components were developed in Power Factory, and all the, um, all the wind-related models were um, implemented or developed in uh, in, uh, in Simulink and exported um, to functional mock-up units. Um, and then, uh, and then during the runtime of the co-simulation, coupled uh, to uh, FMU for co-simulation of, uh, of Power Factory. So about the wind turbine, um, well, it con uh, it's in fact it's a standard type four um, wind turbine model with with on top of it a uh, so-called fault right through controller. So we will explain now in two slides the what is what we we understand under fault right through and this uh, and, and how we implemented factor controller. But with fault right through, uh, it's 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 one of the regulations that um, power plant owners have to comply to on the uh, coupling point, the point of common coupling, and it is commonly um, described as a faulted versus time profile. That um, the uh, if if the wind turbine, the the faulted set wind at the point of common coupling remains um, above the the envelope that is shown here it has to remain connected during a fault and if it enters this gray area so enters the the envelope then it is it either must block its active power output or it has to uh, disconnect uh, the, the parameters differ a little bit per uh, per tso um but the the underlying Idea is that the, the converter and the, the controls of the wind turbine require additional controls for over voltage protection for blocking the IGBTs of the uh, sort of power electronics of the converters. Um, it has might have to adjust current limiting schemes, recovery mechanisms uh, after the fault. So what we did is that we built a fault right through um, controller, adjusting all the um, wind turbine control parameters uh, through a finite state machine. Um, on top of the ordinary uh, factor controller of the wind turbine, 
So what is this? Um, this wind turbine model is so here we see uh, the block diagram. The main block of interest here is the uh, the dashed green block uh, on the left, where we uh, that we developed in uh, in Simulink, which shows a cascaded vector controller of um, a simplified cascaded vector controller of, uh, of a Type Four wind turbine, which has a active power controller and a reactive power uh, controller. Here we uh, are running in um, reactive power control instead of voltage control. But the main idea is that um, uh, and during during the uh, during faults we can boost this uh, this reactive current um, in such uh, proportionally to the voltage to the depth of a voltage dip so we can uh, can support the voltage in fact um, so set points are then provided by this uh, by this converter model block uh, set points that are then uh, translated to actual current injections uh, in, um, in the power factory model through a, a rotation by the phase lock loop and even into Norton transformation and in fact and then uh, through scaling injected into the uh, power factory um, grid model through the static generator uh, standard model block. So Power factory and the whole thing is um, uh, glued together by the FMI plus plus package. So what we show here this is a more um, schematic view of the experiment in terms of uh, tools and blocks that we uh, that we have. So on top we have the master simulator that's run in Python. Python includes the FMI plus plus library, um, which is on its turn able to import FMUs that are compliant to the FMI for co-simulation or the FMI for um, model exchange. Well, um, the, 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 so Power Factory is run in, uh, in co-simulation uh, mode, so it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is run through the, uh, um, or is it, it's connected to the uh, Power Factory API, then uh, as such doing the time stepping. Then the wind turbine models and fault ride through models are then um, connected to the FMI++ library through uh, 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 with a separate solver. And so each wind turbine has two FMUs, one for the vector controller and one for the fault ride through uh, finite state machine controller. So if we have one wind turbine, which is the case in the um, in, in, the, in, in the case where we have a monolithic simulation and test around with a, with a um, co-simulation. And what it could also be individual wind turbines where we, um, what we are going to do in the upscaled part of the simulation. So here is, a, here is an overview of the cases that we developed in, um, in test case one. Um, we had a monolithic case where we had everything in one simulation and, and represented the wind power plant by an aggregated type 4 wind turbine. We had a small scale co-simulation that I was talking about where we, have in, we had in total three um, FMUs, one for co-simulation and two for model exchange. And we uh, have been developing a large scale co-simulation case where we um, divided the entire wind power plant into two, two individual uh, wind turbines and uh, tried to realize the same operating point at the common point of common coupling and then uh, try to compare and see what the uh, what, what conclusions we could uh, draw in terms of, uh, of upscaled uh, coast simulation and as such test the scalability of the approach that we used in, uh, in GRA2. So now I want to uh, uh, oh, sorry. Here is uh, what I what I told you. So the um, the individual wind turbine is then um, replaced by a, an, uh, a cable array uh, together with uh, 32 uh, wind turbines, and in total we have 65 MU FMUs here. So yeah, now I want to give the floor to Richard. Um, who will give a demonstration? 
who will show a demonstration of the. Uh, I will mute, yes. Okay, thank you, Aryan. Uh, now I will present the demonstration video for the large scale tow simulation. So, as Aryan explained everything in theory, there would be 65 FMUs formed. Uh, the power system or the IEEE 9 bus is modeled in the Power Factory platform and the controllers are designed in Simulink. What you see now are the different model and components which we require for the co-simulation. So all of these are already there in the GitHub uh, folder of AeriGrid in TC1. So please don't get confused by all this. And there are also instructions on the GitHub folder how to use them, which uh, the links of which will be given to you later. Uh, now I will go forward with the video. Now, if I move forward a bit, as you see, there is this Python file upscale.py, which will run this code simulation. So now I will execute this Python file. And if we bit, move a bit forward, so, okay. Now you see how the different FMUs are being formed. Yeah, now you see that they are formed. So because we had already run this test before, it says it already exists, but this is how the, because we have 32 wind turbines and each have their own controllers, two controllers each. We have numerous FMUs being formed here. And now as we move forward, you see that, now we'll pause the video. Now you see that at each, the, at each end of the wind turbine, we see the terminal voltage and it is updated at every 0 0.01 second. Uh, it is interesting to note the terminal voltage of each wind turbine because we want to see if the controllers for all of them are working fine. So <clears throat> now, as you can see, now it's 1.04 PU, which is uh, almost normal. Uh, the event which we simulate is a short circuit event, which will happen at one second. So I will slightly go forward to the event. So as you can see, it updates for all the 32 wind turbines each. Uh... Okay, now if you look closely at the screen at one second, there would be a short circuit and the voltage will go down. And as you see, the voltage has gone down across all the wind turbines. So it shows that now uh, the fault has happened and the our controllers uh, will come into effect. And with the boosting of the reactive current, the voltage support will be provided. And this uh, fault right through support is critical because it is a necessity for the grid code compliance. So as you see now, as the time increases, we see the voltage has been ramped up to 0.9 PU, uh, which means our controllers are working fine and they are uh, providing the FRT support which is needed. So as you can see now, we are almost back to the levels which we started with, which is 1.04 PU. So I will move a bit forward. Yeah, and now as you see, it's almost the same. So the support has been provided and FRT uh, capability has been proved. Now, as we go towards the end of the simulation, we will be plotting uh, a few wind turbine parameters. So as you can see, there would be a lot of plots and they are being plotted now because the simulation has ended. So I will go a bit forward to show you the interesting parts. So I randomly chose a wind turbine, which is in this case, I think wind turbine nine, as you can see, I am plotting, as you can see the output power and the terminal voltage, which is in red and output power is in blue. So as you can see, they started fine. And then at the instant of one second, there was a fault, the voltage dips considerably. Then the controller reactive power support comes into play and it boosts the voltage and slowly and steadily we move back to the uh, voltage uh, which we need, which is around one PU. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, the, the pattern is almost the same for both of uh, the output power and the voltage. So from this uh, experiment, we intend to show that even in a large scale co-simulation involving complex systems, multiple FMUs, uh, uh, the interaction goes on fine, the co-simulation goes on fine, which indicates the coupling and interfaces are working fine. And this also uh, proves 
uh, that the co-simulation for FRT, which we did, is uh, is correct and is working uh, uh, efficiently. So this was the demonstration I wanted to give, and I would now uh, switch back to the other test cases which we had done in our GRA2 work package. Thank you, Risha, for your uh, test case. So the next test case is TCU, which uh, is interfacing on a OLTC, so online tap changer, and an FMI terminal block. So first of all, we have to see what it means uh, FMI. So FMI terminal block is an ad hoc of a FMI orchestrator, plus a software PLC based on EAC61 uh, for a uh, 99 and OLTC so in uh, almost of all here we are developing so uh, such devices so on low top changer which is an, a heavy electronic mechanical device mounted on a medium voltage uh, distribution transformer to maintain the voltage so a uh, stable and uh, secondary of the transformer uh, yes uh, before I go here I will back here just to explain our uh, uh, experiments. So here we have done two types of experiments. So we have replaced our OLTC by an open source electronics is, uh, with an Arduino. And also we have exported our OLTC as an FMU to show the interaction between these two devices and this visual device and the hardware device with FMI terminal block. Yes, this is the two uh, experiments. One is a pure software um, experiment, and the other is with hardware in the loop uh, inside the, 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 the experiment. Yes, this is our diagram, a diagram of the AIC 61499. Uh, so, this is the, the hardware diagram. And yes, just I will uh, go directly to the demonstration. I have a video here of how we have done this uh, demonstration. So, we have used the 4 the uh, so EID where we have our um, EIC61499 diagram for both experiments. And here we have our uh, FMU of the OLGC. Okay, so the two experiments are here. So we will run the experiments. So it's a dot batch, uh, as a batch uh, file which run all the experiments here. So this is, we have, we have seen that our, uh, the model of the OLGC is inside uh, the, the, this folder. And yes, we will run, we will show the, the communication between our diagram and the FMU model. So you can see that the connection using Modwas is done. And here we, have, we are seeing that the, the, the connection is done and it to, took the time to the, so to the, do all the co-simulation. So this is the first experiment. So a connection and an FMU model exchange with a, a software PLC. Okay, so the, Second experiment would be so the hardware and the loop we will put our so emulator the emulator of our uh, OLTC which is done as I told before using uh, a Arduino so implementing the Modbus communication with the Arduino so here we will start our uh, experiment.
This is a file to run all the experiments, run all those ones. Yes, we see that's the voltage normally. It represents the voltage in, in the inputs of the OLGC. And using Arduino, we are changing this voltage using a potentiometer. And we will show the interaction with, uh, with the Arduino. So I will change the voltage, the input. And we can see that the software PLC is uh, so uh, receiving this uh, voltage and yes basing in this inputs we can see that uh, the position also of the tape of the, the transformer will change so there are several uh, levels of uh, voltage that uh, so uh, control the output of the the tap the top number of the position of the top of in the output of the of the transform so we can see here up and down is the so we are is so controlling the 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 top changer so if we would so go up or go down with the the taps yes there are there was the two uh, experiments so after that we have make uh, sorry. so the results with the coupling of and the style of coupling these two uh, experiments so here we can see the results and Yes, we can see that uh, the experiment shows the matching results between the predictive configuration and uh, the reference uh, simulation. And uh, both experiments show different real time delays. Uh, and here we can see that also uh, the PLC controller is very, very much so with the, with the simulation uh, signals. Yes, uh, about the documentation of the both uh, so uh, tools, uh, you can see so in as before uh, I think in the final of the documents we will see the the links of our two, two experiments. So you can download. So the FMI terminal block, which is made by IT, with, um, and uh, so our uh, OLCC controller done in Arduino also is uh, disponible in uh, GitHub. So thank you. And I will pass the presentation to my colleague, Edmund, for the next uh, test uh, case. Thank you, Nobu. So last but not least, I will uh, show you our work that we did on signal-based synchronization between simulators. So basically a FMI compliant co-simulation <coughs> co approach for uh, assessments, uh, including communication networks. Uh, I guess it's not a secret if I tell you that uh, using communication networks is becoming more and more a trend in smart grid applications, especially for uh, accessing information and actuating controllers. But using this kind of technology, of course, also comes with a lot of questions. Basically, you want to assess the effects of the properties and the physical limitations of such uh, communication channels on the system, <clears throat> including, uh, including subjects like stability of closed loop control systems, uh, handling of, of communication errors, but also, of course, uh, cyber attacks, including intentional injection, inhibition, or manipulation of data. And if you go through literature, you will see that co-simulation has become quite a popular approach to assess these kinds of uh, uh, case studies. Uh, 
with the obvious advantage that uh, using the most appropriate tool for each of the involved domains gives you a strong handle on, 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 on collecting domain expertise from experts. But on the other hand, you will also notice that there's quite a challenge because it turns out that it seems to be quite hard to reuse existing work and to exchange models between uh, existing approaches. And if you look into some detail of that, you will see that, or you will find that uh, what's described quite often is that there's a lack of openly available simulator interface implementations. And in, within this context, the error grid approach was to base a, a approach on, on the functional mockup interface, obviously, which is itself an open interface specification, but then also to provide an open source prototype implementation uh, for, for doing such an assessment based on the network simulator NS3. This approach came along with quite some challenges regarding FMI uh, because co-simulation based on FMI is, is, is mostly focusing on, let's call them here, physical systems, which where you basically exchange information about what's, what's happening uh, in terms of physical properties like voltage levels or temperatures, etc. And then within the co-simulation, you typically just set the values of the associated model variables from one simulator to the other. However, with communication systems, uh, this is a bit different as you don't just exchange values, but you really exchange messages, which means you have to uh, take into account details of transmission, including protocols, metadata, data formats, and so on. And also communication network simulators typically provide dedicated functionality to do these kind of things. So regarding FMI, this means this poses some challenges as uh, the FMI standard provides no specific functionality uh, for, uh, regarding uh, message transmissions. So basically you have somehow to hide the, these details behind the FMI compliant co-simulation interface, which I will cover uh, on the coming slides. And also FMI only in its current version uh, provides limited support for event-based co-simulation, which means that uh, there is no direct support for event detection or event prediction. And there's also no notion of an input or the output being present or actually absent, uh, which I will also cover in, in the coming slides in, in, a, in a bit more detail. So what was the uh, approach proposed uh, by Eric Grid? So basically we said, okay, these details of data transmission protocols must be hidden behind the FMI compliant interface, which means that what we did was we, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we came up with the concept of message IDs, basically where transmitted data is associated with a unique message ID and the message ID is being forwarded to the simulator of the communication system. And this message ID is then associated with basically with mock-up messages, which the simulator generates internally and are associated to these message IDs. And then the, the whole simulation within the uh, communication network simulator is then used, uh, is, is then using these mock-up messages uh, so you don't need to consider the translation uh, of the original data to a proper data format, but you use this mock-up message instead. And once you're done with the communication network simulation, basically what you give back uh, is again this mock-up message and you can then in your co-simulation translate it back to the initial value. And with this, uh, I, uh, with this concept of messages and mock-up messages, it's also possible to uh, have a proper definition of the absence of messages, which is quite important in event-based uh, simulation. So basically, we use a unique message ID which represents uh, the absence of input or output messages. I will give an example of that uh, in one of the coming slides. Uh, the other challenge was uh, the event handling. Uh, so basically, uh, in these types of simulations, we have uh, two types of events that are of special interest for us. The one are input events, which mark the arrival of new, mes of new messages at an input of the simulated communication network. Um, and <clears throat> which means that a value of, of an FMU input variable changes from zero to the corresponding message ID. So basically, when you have a FMU with an event queue internally, uh, and you receive a new event, you basically get a message ID and this then has to translate it somehow through the internal simulation to a new event in your event queue. Uh, similarly, with output events, uh, output event obviously marks the arrival of a message at an end node in the communication network simulator. And this then corresponds to an output message ID as the value of an associated output variable. So that means, uh, let's assume you are at event N 
in the event queue uh, and you basically have as an output the, the message ID. So that's the idea. How does the event handling for FMUs for co-simulation work in this case uh, in detail? So as I said before, the FMI specification does not yet provide a uh, uh, real support for uh, internal or actually even external events for, for co-simulation. So what we did was in view of, of, uh, of, of things to happen was to come up with a quick and dirty solution to demonstrate the feasibility of our approach but not to put too much focus on the specific proposal uh, as, we, uh, as it can be anticipated for FMI 3.0 to, uh, to have this uh, this problem basically solved. And what we do here is, is basically quite, should, should be quite easily transferable to this new approach. So what did we do? So basically we start with uh, internal event prediction. So we say that an FMU has to define a dedicated output variable that always, whose value always corresponds to the time of the next internal event. And event processing is done using so-called iterations, so that simulation steps with step size equal to zero, which triggers the FMU to process the events. So assume again that we are event at event N. Uh, this means our outputs, as I said before, is uh, the corresponding message ID of the, of the message being uh, delivered there. And for the event uh, prediction, it's the time of the next event, Tn plus one. If you then decide to step directly to the next event, uh, you advance the time of the FMU. This means that uh, as there is, as, as you have not yet uh, processed the event, the output is uh, accordingly absent and the output is zero. So message ID zero means no output. And the time is still pointing to this event. Unless you then really process the event, that means you iterate the FMU, you make a simulation step size equal to zero, at which uh, then internally the FMU realizes, okay, you really stepped to the event and you're processing it. So it also uh, then sets the output to the corresponding message ID of uh, event n plus one, and then the time prediction to the next event n plus two. That's the basic functionality of uh, how this uh, event handling occurs in this case. Based on, based on this concept, uh, we developed uh, a module for the NS3 network simulator. Uh, we called it FMI export. Basically what it does is it creates, it, or it helps you to create a FMU for co-simulation from a user-defined NS3 script. Basically it implements a tool coupling mechanism which controls the execution of the simulator at runtime and then also establish, uh, establishes a connection for data exchange. At the current version of it, the interaction with NS3 is still limited to repeated execution of the same NS3 script, which basically means that at each call of the FMU steps uh, step method, uh, you execute the same model. But as you can use different random seeds at each time, you also produce different outputs. What the user has to do is to implement a dedicated class called simple event queue FMU base, which uh, provides dedicated functionality to declare input and output variables and uh, functions for adding events to in the internal event queue. Uh, the links will be available also then, I think, in the final slide. And uh, there is also a link from the Eric Ritz homepage. But I want to also uh, put your attention to the fact that there is that this is an open source implementation that, that, it's, uh, uh, that it's available at, at GitHub. As I said, uh, there is a nice uh, GitHub page. So with, uh, with all the uh, with, uh, instructions on how to install and how to run simple examples. Uh, basically what you have to do as a user is you have to uh, use some dedicated NS3 application layer models basically uh, for clients and servers. The clients and servers are configured in a way that you can track uh, the, the, the creation and uh, uh, the, the, so, so the sending and the receiving of messages and then calculate end-to-end -end delays, which you then can translate into, uh, into events in the event queue. But otherwise, you can use standard NS3 component models uh, as you used in, 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 uh, from, from NS3. So basically, NS3 experts uh, can, can use the model, adapt them, uh, can use the models, adapt them, and then create FMUs from that for use in a simulation, in a co-simulation. I will show you a simple example here. 
uh, basically consisting of two nodes, node A and node B, uh, with the idea that uh, you send data from A to B. Uh, this is then uh, implemented in, in a typical NS3 script and wrapped with a FMU, where, we, where there is one input variable called node A send and one output variable node B receive, basically uh, referring to, uh, so, so basically if, if you uh, add a new event at node A, then this, uh, this, this message ID is then sent to node B and at node B receive, so at the value, uh, at variable node B receive, you should be able then to retrieve this message ID again, uh, indicating uh, the message being sent with a certain delay. I will show you a simple test case for with a periodic sender and a receiver at the other end. So this is <clears throat> really the most simple thing that you can do. And I also want to, <coughs> excuse me, I'll draw your attention that this is online, or you can actually look at it. There is available a so-called compute capsule on Code Ocean where you can uh, look into this uh, simulation in some detail. Uh, we can also look into the FMU. What I will show you now is basically available online under this uh, under this uh, uh, URL. I will now show you uh, what happened here exactly. Sorry for that. So as I said before, the user has to uh, implement a dedicated class called simple event queue FMU base. Uh, there you define, in this case, you can see the definition uh, of the input uh, variable of the output variable, some parameters. And the most important thing is you have to define or you have to implement two, uh, two functions. The one is called initialize simulation and the other one is called run simulation. Uh, I, I guess the, the, the naming is, is quite obvious what that means. Basically, in initialize, initialize simulation, you can quite simply add those, uh, those variables as inputs and outputs to FMU. And then in run simulation, uh, I will not go into details here, but this is basically standard NS3, uh, standard NS3 uh, code to make such a simple test case from sending one node to the other. The test basically looks like this. Uh, this uh, this uh, Python package comes with a with a script to uh, to create the FMU. You can see here I basically define the name of the FMU. I also say I also spe specify the FMI version that I want to use. Here you can see my local path to the script that creates the FMU, uh, and here the path to uh, the NS3 script that implements the uh, simulation that I just showed you before. And basically what I have to do is I then run the script. So now when I run it, you will see uh, the output. So you see the debug version says it's uh, using FMI version two. In the background, uh, it compiles, it uses NS3 to compile the NS3 script. And in the end, uh, so there's some additional debugging output, but in the end it says FMU created successfully. So that's great so that we can, we can use that now. Uh, the, so the way I use it here is, is uh, again using this FMI++ package that has been mentioned before. I won't go too much into the details here of what's happening. Sorry for all the jumping around. But what you see is basically I load the FMU, I instantiate it, uh, and I can even set a uh, parameter for, for, for the channel delay, and then I initialize the FMU, and then Due to lack of time, I cannot go into too much details, but I told you that uh, I told you already that it's basically available online. You can run it. Also, the code is available on GitHub. Uh, you basically run the whole uh, simulation using this uh, using this approach that I uh, explained before briefly. So basically, you always retrieve the time of the next event. If there's no event scheduled, you advance the simulation time to send the next uh, to send the next message. Otherwise, you advance to the next event in time. So if this is then indeed a uh, event time, then you iterate the FMU and uh, you can uh, basically receive the message. So this is uh, a short, uh, a short event loop. And if I run this, you uh, receive some 
some input, uh, so some output, some 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 written output uh, from from the simulation itself, uh, and you basically can see that uh, you basically step from one simulation time to the next. You always have uh, uh, the next uh, event time as a uh, uh, as a prediction, and you can really step from one to the other and res uh, and then extract your message at these. So basically, you see here first. You send a message with ID one, and later on you also receive it. Sorry. And then this this continues with with, with other message IDs. So that's the main idea here. Going back to the presentation, but of course this is a very let's say uh, academic uh, example. There are also more advanced examples available that you can look at. For example. Uh, this one where we used a actually a controller in uh, a coordinated voltage controller uh, with uh, uh, combined with a electrical network. Uh, basically, what we did there was a full-blown co-simulation where we used a more or less realistic, simple but still realistic uh, network model. We used a simple but realistic uh, model for the communication network, and then we used also a uh, not uh, still a simple but a rule-based uh, controller for the voltage uh, for the voltage coordination, and this then is really applied to a, to a full-blown co-simulation where uh, FMUs are used for all domain-specific models. So NS3 for the communication network, Power Factory for the power system, uh, MATLAB scripts for the controller. Again, this is available online. I encourage you to look into that. Uh, all the instructions on how to run it and 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 how to uh, uh, how to install it are, are given there. Uh, just as, as a teaser, basically what the results show you is he, here you see what you would usually expect. So you can see uh, the, the, in the lower figure the voltages uh, from, uh, from, the, from the two meters in, in this test setup. And you see that after some time, uh, one of the meters, the, the, basically the voltage drops below the threshold, below the operational threshold. And then on the, lower, uh, on the upper figures, you see that the tap position of a Tap, of an online tap changing transformer uh, changes accordingly. If you indeed implement that using uh, using the communication simulation and so on, what you realize is that things do not always happen as uh, you would expect them, uh, meaning that that under certain circumstances, due to dead times of the controller, due to communication delays, and so on and so on. So there's quite some complexity even in this simple test case. You can end up with results that you didn't expect, like nothing happens or Actually, the tap position may uh, change by, by two taps at once. Um, and this co-simulation setup basically gives the opportunity to then really evaluate uh, under, which, uh, uh, under which circumstances, for example, in this case here, controller dead time uh, and, and, and uh, uh, the difference between the sending of the signals, what actually happens. So you can basically assess very detailed uh, what's going on here. Yes, to conclude, so we developed in Ericrid, we de developed a prototype for a NS3 module that allows to uh, create FMUs for core simulation. It's, again, I want to stress that it's open source and it's available, uh, it's available online, you can use that. Uh, it's based on a semantically clear mapping of the requirements for such message-based simulations to the FMI specifications. And where this was not uh, possible, basically we used simple workarounds uh, that are expected to be compatible with future extensions of the FMI standard. And of course, we're also hoping to develop uh, this, uh, to, to, to work further on, 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 uh, uh, on this approach. So the goals here would be then to also synchronize at runtime and not only to have uh, individual simulation runs. But for the time now, uh, for the time being, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you for listening. I encourage you to look into the, uh, uh, the online uh, examples. And with that, I give back to Thomas. Thank you, Edmund, and all the presenters that presented her the uh, information uh, about our co-simulation activities. Uh, one moment, I need to, uh, to switch back to my uh, to my screen. One moment.
Good. Yeah, this this work that you saw uh, today uh, was organized. I uh, was uh, carried out in the European uh, Horizon 2020 project uh, Iriquid. Uh, it's a research infrastructure program that is uh, mainly has been mainly developed for um, supporting uh, technology development and validation and rollout of smart grid solution. Uh, all the uh, um, uh, examples, the test cases that you saw, are available on our uh, GitHub account. You see the, the links here, here, and we also share uh, the handout as well as the recording of this uh, webinar uh, uh, later on, either today or tomorrow to you, uh, to all the, the attendees. Um, we have a couple of questions for, um, Oh, we have time for a couple of questions, sorry. Uh, there was uh, one question from uh, Ming Kua Tran. Uh, the slides uh, um, will be shared. There was the question that uh, where the slides can be found. We will share the slides uh, later on um, on our project website. You will get also a, a mail uh, where you can find uh, all the uh, information material that was presented today. Then we have another question that is from Chipran Ali. Uh, hi, uh, one moment, a couple of questions coming in. Um, he's asking if all the um, uh, information are available as uh, libraries. Uh, yes, we share them as uh, open access on our uh, Synodo community. That's an open uh, access repository. Uh, and on GitHub, uh, you will find all the uh, the links in the handout, which we will send to you uh, later today. Uh, then we have a question from, or two questions from Rad Stanev. Uh, the first one is regarding, regarding FRT studies. Have you made um, a validation and comparison between real records from FRT transient uh, Events occurred and result, uh, results achieved using the test uh, case co-simulation. I think our colleague, colleagues from uh, TU Delft uh, can answer that. So, Arian, would you please be able to answer this question? I'm sorry, Thomas, can you repeat the question? Uh, yep, there was a question from uh, Rad Stanev regarding the uh, uh, oh, fault yeah. rate uh, FRT studies. Have you made a, a validation and comparison between real records from FRT transient events occurred and uh, results achieved using test case co simulation? Um, no, not from um, the question. Uh, it's a good question because the uh, idea of having this uh, ramping uh, rate included in the, and, and, um, and this. Or T curve uh, tracking is, um, is is mainly based on um, the, the work I did for, which included also the fault right through of uh, in this case offshore wind power plants. Then yeah, we um, relied on standardized models from uh, from uh, wind power plants. This, these models were by then under standardization uh, by the uh, IC, and they are based on Kind of, kind of real measurements. Um, the idea of the fault right through controller on top of these type four models um, is mainly was mainly based on um, to to test around with um, with with various um, initiation parameters of the um, of the fault right through. For instance, uh, when will it be engaged? Will it be engaged when the voltage is below a certain threshold, or will it be engaged when the angle is um, when there is an angle excursion, for instance? So these are things that that um, that, that led to the development of a finite state machine for the fault right through uh, controller. Um, this uh, has been validated with, or this has been compared to a full EMT simulation. Um, in in the past, so that is that is considered the base case uh, for for that. Yeah, oh yes, it's also well, yeah. So the MT case is also in the deliverable, and there's also a comparison of the co-simulation with the with the monolithic equivalent of the um, of the wind power plant simulation um, in deliverable um, DGRA uh, two point three. Does it answer your question? Yeah, 
Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, that answer well is uh, more, more than enough, uh, Arian, many thanks. Uh, and you can all uh, find the uh, deliverables also on our project website. The links are provided in the handouts that we are sharing with you uh, later on. Uh, there's a next uh, question. I think it goes to uh, to Edmund uh, from Li Tan. Uh, if, uh, I have one question: Can NS3 FMI export integrate NS3 and Mosaic? Yes, indeed. This uh, this last test case that I showed you, this this more complex one, and then there's even another one uh, online on, on on the GitHub repository. So they actually use Mosaic. So these test setups are uh, basically show the the, the whole um, the, the whole the whole uh, development uh, that we did in in in, in Eric Grid in this regard as as was shown in the beginning. So we used this uh, uh, this updated version of Mosaic. We used uh, the FMI plus plus library. We used uh, this uh, NS3 uh, exporter and we put. And, and Power Factory and, 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 and MATLAB scripts for the controller, and we put all of these things together uh, for these test cases that are online. Basically, they serve as a reference, and, uh, the, the, and, and what you find online, I think I said it before, but it includes also uh, instructions on, on how to install it and how to run it, and, and so on. Thank you, Edmund. And there's a uh, next question uh, from Itzko Hadachi. Did you have uh, the chance to simulate cascading failures from communication to power grid? Uh, maybe it goes also to you, Edmund. Can you answer that? Well, we did not do it. No, <laughs> no, actually not. Uh, what we did in another test case that's also available online is that uh, that we showed how, how for example, more uh, uh, well, how should I put it? Uh, more advanced uh, issues regarding communication networks, how they can uh, be included into a core simulation. So what we what we did include was uh, uh, cross-channel, what it's called, uh, cross-channel talk, no, um, cross-channel interference. Uh, but we did not look into cascading failures, no. Okay, thank you, Edmund. I think that was the last question. Uh, if uh, potentially other questions arise, uh, you can uh, drop us an email via our project website and we will uh, try to answer to answer your question. Uh, please feel free also to use uh, the, the software that we are sharing uh, uh, as open access um, modules. Uh, as uh, already said, you can find all the uh, information in the links that we are providing uh, to you with uh, the uh, handouts and the recording. So I think it's time to close this uh, webinar. I want to thank all the speakers for the interesting insights uh, of the developments that we uh, did during uh, the last couple of years in the Horizon 2020 Eurigrid project. And I want to thank also all the attendees uh, for uh, attending this webinar. And I hope that you get a, a nice overview of what we did. And please feel free to use our developments. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a nice day. Goodbye.